a special presentation of LOBF with archaeologists Dr. Lawrence Garrity and Dr. Doug Clark, Excavating the Bible. Welcome to this edition of Excavating the Bible, What Archaeology Can Teach Us. This program is, dedicating, is dedicated to exploring the discoveries of archaeology in the Middle East and how they help us understand and appreciate the Bible. I'm Doug Clark, director of the Center for Near Eastern Archaeology at La Sierra University in Riverside, California. And to help us discuss today's topic, which is biblical connections with Herbert um, Ataruz in South Central Jordan, is Dr. Chung Ho Ji, who is from the School of Education at La Sierra University, director of this project, and my co-host, Dr. Larry Garrity, also from La Sierra and founder of the Madaba Plains Project Excavations. So let's talk about some archaeology and what mm -hmm. we can learn, mm -hmm. especially with Ataruz. We have a map on our screen. Mm -hmm. Chung Ho, tell us where Ataruz is, then we'll look at some slides, mm -hmm. think about it. And then what we really want to get at this evening and to this, this particular program is um, religion and what mm -hmm. we know about religion from this site and from other sites in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as you see on the map there, uh, that sea is in the middle, and then on the left is Jerusalem, yeah. and then Madaba and Amman, the modern city. The Herbert Ataruz is in the central Jordan, nearby that sea. So where that, you know, in the center, the Herbert Aturus with the yellow pin is marked. That is and, and this is an Arabic name mm -hmm. for a Hebrew name in the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, which is what? Almost the same, Ataroth. Uh, and that is close, isn't it? Um, it is very It's close. not often. I mean, we might say Heshban, Hesban, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. although people would debate that. Mm -hmm. uh, but mm -hmm. a lot of sites, there, there are no connections. Right. Um, right. But with this one, it seems to be fairly close. So mm -hmm. we have lots to discover. We want to think about the site. Mm -hmm. And we have an, an, kind of an archaeologist way of looking at a site. Talk yeah. to us about this, Chang. Archaeologists look at the walls all the time. <laughs> not all the time, but most of the time. But actually, this is the ancient buildings that was excavated in Herbert Ataruz. And then Ataruz is known for a cultic site. And then the walls that you see, especially those with dark color, are the temple buildings. So cultic doesn't mean what popularly we think about is this is a cult or that is a cult. What does it mean? It, it is kind of a, something to do with religious belief. Has to do with practice. worship it and is. with religion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about a cultic artifact or a cultic place, we're talking about something that ties to worship that and, is right. and, to, and to religion. Mm -hmm. And about what time period are we looking at here? This building that we are looking at is 9th century BC, especially the middle of the 9th century BC, which means about 850 to 840 BC. And what was going on in the Bible at that time? That was the time that uh, King Ahab and his father Omni, mm -hmm. and then King Jehu comes about 830 to 25 BC. Mm -hmm. So here mm -hmm. we are talking about the King Ahab's and Elijah and mm -hmm. Elijah period. Mm -hmm. So we're after the time of what we call the United Monarchy with mm -hmm. David and Saul, well, Saul, David, and Solomon. That's right. And so we've got this divided monarchy, the north of Israel, the south with Judah, uh, and we've got some, we've got kings from both of those. In fact, with the stories connected mm -hmm. in the Bible, and in the famous Mesha stela or inscription, That's right. we have them connected with this uh, site as well. It is. Actually, this is the peak days of the Northern Kingdom of Israel in many ways mm -hmm. in terms of territorial and political military expansion. And also, this is the high time for the economic. In other words, even though in the Bible, this is the time that is tarnished because religious, you know, the kind of uh, the departure from the mainstream or traditional, what the King Ahab was practicing with his father. But uh, if we put aside religious kind of perspective, in terms of politics, economy, and military, this is the high time for the mm -hmm. Northern Kingdom of Israel. Mm -hmm. And for some, at least the Northern Kingdom, that extends into the 8th century, where we get the rise of the writing prophets like Amos, who, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. good times are good, but he's, uh, he's concerned that uh, there's abuse going on, especially of the poor. It is. So it's that context of good times, but nevertheless, it is. social ills. That's right. Uh, that never probably disappeared. Uh, you know, but I it's think always it's there. It yeah. is always there. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, an isometric drawing of yeah. uh, the site as well. 
So maybe we'll move to uh, another slide that would indicate mm -hmm. the real. Okay, we had drawings. Now we have the real. This is That's this right. is what the archaeologist clears and exposes mm -hmm. and, and and allows us now to see. When we say temple complex or kind of a building associated with it, at the center of those complex there must be sanctuary room. And then the room that we see here is main sanctuary of the Herbert Atarou's temple. And you see the offering platform in the middle at the center. And then to the right, you see the standing stone. And then right in front of that, in the shade, shade it is an altar. And then around there, we found uh, lots of lots of objects that is associated with the religious worship and then you know, other religious practices. Is there anything in this level of Atarus, in this particular mm. stratum, that is not cultic, that is not religious, that is not somehow dedicated to worship? Not this particular <coughs> building, not in this particular period. In other words, this ninth century, especially on the northern side and western side of the Atarus, is everything something to do with religion. To do. Yeah. So, and that's why this site allows us um, an entree into the, the world of ancient religion, which mm -hmm. will apply to ancient Israel, ancient Judah, Moab, Edom, the Ammonites, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, across the board. And so I think that's one, of, that's one of the nice things that you've, one of the nice results of your going there and excavating, is that we have a springboard mm -hmm. to jump into these discussions about. And when the prophets in Israel are complaining about the kind of things that their adherents mm -hmm. to Yahweh worship are doing, this is the kind of thing that they're getting into, getting in trouble. And I think in some ways uh, that this is the function, the primary function of archaeology in the Bible, and that is to illustrate, mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. give this background, to provide mm -hmm. this backdrop mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so that we actually can read the text with a lot more understanding. That mm -hmm. is right, because mm -hmm. the Bible is about religious faith, a confession of the religious people's you know, belief or faith mm -hmm. about their God. And then the Ataruth is kind of a showcase showing that maybe part of the people or part of the area, this kind of a cult or religious practice was happening. And then in many ways, it shed light on what we read in the Bible. Some of them are same overlap, and other parts, they are different. Mm -hmm. So this is the question, of course, the mm -hmm. issue that we have to deal with. But apparently, it helps us understand what was really going on, you know, at the... Right. I have wondered before. if part of the value of archaeology is, is what you just said. We have the text, and mm -hmm. the text already has some diversity in right. how mm -hmm. these mm -hmm. various expressions of religion are, are, are practiced mm -hmm. and or appreciated. I mean, mm -hmm. sometimes in the earlier periods, some of the practices of high places were okay. Mm -hmm. Later on, they become a problem. That's right. Um, but especially this, the idea that religion, which of course is central. There, there were no atheists. Right. Really, yeah. That was not an option mm -hmm. in the biblical period. Mm -hmm. And so with these religions, I wonder how many times people quite genuinely uh, had one God as the God they worshiped, but you know, sometimes to get a second opinion. You, mm -hmm. you want to see mm -hmm. if in fact there isn't another answer, or another way. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering how much that didn't happen just in general mm -hmm. and, and maybe was accepted, maybe wasn't. The prophets certainly came down hard mm -hmm. on that is uh, right. people. Mm -hmm. So maybe different time periods mm -hmm. would be affected here too. And wasn't it the custom that the gods went along with territory and the people? Correct. So that if you mm -hmm. were in this part of the country, that was the God that was worshipped over here, another mm -hmm. God. And so you sort of recognize that that was where that God held sway. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Which also gives insight into the importance of territory, mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. importance of land. Mm -hmm. um, it's not just something you purchase no. for however many shekels. Mm -hmm. right. It is Chemosh's territory, <laughs> right, or it right. is, um, or, the, or Milcom mm -hmm. in, in the Ammonites, or mm -hmm. it is Yahweh in, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. in, in Israel. Mm -hmm. So yeah. you know, that, so what okay. do we got here? Well, this is still in the middle of excavation. This is the area so-called the Western Courtyard. Mm -hmm. And then the stone that is the stick up from the ground is actually about 30 centimeters still we need to excavate. So about a foot. If we're That's right, about a foot. This right. is a standing stone, mm -hmm. standing in situ, right in front, at the center of the Western Courtyard. Mm -hmm. So people to go inside the temple has to go through 
bypass this standing stone. Mm -hmm. And then this leads to actually what I call the western high place of the temple. You know, so it, it indicates that because in the Bible we oftentimes read about the stones that people you know, erected. It could be um, the territorial mark, it could be the symbol of God, many you know, functions. In Atarus temple, standing stone was used in different occasions, not just in the main sanctuary, but also at least two standing stones seem to have stand in the middle of the courtyard. Mm -hmm. And that actually indicates probably this is a holy place. Standing mm -hmm. stones? Everywhere. There are. You Going know. far, far back mm -hmm. in the deserts, for instance, of the Negev, in the northern mm -hmm. Sinai, uh, people who studied those, typically come in clusters of odd numbers, mm -hmm. three, five, seven, That's right. sometimes even nine. Mm -hmm. We might even see a picture or two of some of those. That's right. In Umeri, we have those you know, right. five. We have a cluster right? of five. five. In Atarut case, they found just as a single standing ah. stone, ah. and then it is kind of a, in the middle of the quarter or at the center point of the sanctuary building. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Biblical Hebrew has a term for that stone, doesn't it? Matzeva, mm -hmm. or many of them would be Matzevoth. So they knew all about these stones. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Everybody was aware of them. Yeah. It is. And in a sense, if we were to look for a modern uh, counterpart, it would be maybe a steeple. Uh, yes. It's not that that would be a place of, um, uh, we wouldn't be bowing to a steeple, but, mm -hmm. but it would say, here's where worship happened. Mm -hmm. That's right, mm -hmm. yeah. And it, I'm not sure they bowed to these either. In this particular stone, I don't think so, right. because I couldn't find any kind of an offering to bench or right. in a path in front right. of it. Right. So right. it was standing in the middle of the courtyard. Right, right. Now at our site at Amari, just uh, north mm -hmm. of yours, uh, we do have evidence of an altar mm -hmm. in front of these standing stones and the sorts of little figurines that were yes, uh -huh. being placed on mm -hmm. them, perhaps with some kind of gift of fruit or grain or mm -hmm. something like mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. Was it inside the building or in the That was in the sanctuary, in, in the, the sanctuary, central that's part. Right. But mm -hmm. in the entryway, mm -hmm. it was the standing stones, like you're talking about. These, you have to go past these. Mm -hmm. Somehow these indicated you have come into sacred space. It mm -hmm. is. But the very sacred space, the inner space, Mm -hmm. was the sanctuary where the altar was right in front of the standing right. stone. So mm -hmm. standing stone, I mean, as in Umeri, standing stone could be inside the sanctuary, right. could stand outside right. the main building. Right, mm -hmm. right. In fact, we even have at Umeri what we call a household shrine, matches very closely mm -hmm. Judges 17, mm -hmm. 18, yeah. um, with a standing stone right up against the wall mm -hmm. and an altar in front of it. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it seems to be standard practice. It, uh, has, it goes back. And probably yeah. everywhere. This, right. this isn't just places outside of Israel. This, this is standard stuff mm -hmm. that's happening. Mm -hmm. And the figurines too. Mm -hmm. That's right. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, our Taruth is not exceptional. It is right. one of many you know, examples right. that right. we right. see. Right. 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 So this is another standing stone that is still, I mean, that was lying on the courtyard. This is broken, but uh, it is found in the center. So this photo is kind of in the middle of excavation of mm -hmm. that standing mm -hmm. stone. Mm -hmm. And there yep, we are. This Standard is from the gap. This yes. is from the gap just to show that how common, you know, this kind of standing stone or worship or cult was, especially in the desert area. Mm -hmm. And notice, this is desert forever, mm -hmm. and out in the middle, I don't know how many of these, mm -hmm. but there are, I mean, there are scores, what, yes. hundreds of hundreds. these right. Those, right. out in the desert, which mm -hmm. somehow gives a sense of sacredness to mm -hmm. these remote areas. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't, I don't know how to put all of that together. I haven't studied it that carefully, mm -hmm. but uh, there's something about being out there, away, mm -hmm. where worship happens in a unique kind of way. That's and let's not forget that the three monotheistic religions all began in this part of the world. Right, mm -hmm. yeah. right, 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 right. Grew out of. Grew that's out right, of especially this, from yeah. desert environment. Right, 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 right. right, right, right. Yeah. A different uh, place. <laughs> We're now over on the other side of the Dead Sea right. in, in Arad. And um, Chang Ho, tell us about this uh, structure. Just an example showing that uh, the standing stone was not just in the east part of the Levant, but also in the Judite and also the Israelite side. So this Arad is the military kind of a fort, mm -hmm. belong to the Judite kingdom. And then this sanctuary that was found, you see the two standing stones mm -hmm. in the sanctuary. So it, it was uh, part of the popular or religion, at least the cult, 
that probably, I don't know how that was understood by the prophets, but this was very common practice mm -hmm. in the Levant. Well, and this is uh, 8th century, if I recall. That's right. Mm -hmm. So we have prophets at work in Jerusalem. We also have a very well-functioning temple in mm -hmm. Jerusalem. Uh, there's this one, there's the one in Beersheba. Mm -hmm. So these were going on, and if you start from the lower right-hand corner, you, you went straight for the standing stones, but if you start from the lower right-hand corner, mm -hmm. there's an altar, an entryway into the holy place, and mm -hmm. then the Holy of Holies where you have these standing stones. That's right. So here was worship going on at mm -hmm. the same time in the temple, and at least some of the books of the Bible say, only in Jerusalem should we be doing this. So people have wondered if that was a kind of a later reform. And maybe mm -hmm. this was okay at the time, but later it just became too problematic to have too many places. People have argued different ways on this. Yeah. And in the Northern Kingdom, remember Jeroboam didn't want people going down to Jerusalem to worship. And mm -hmm. so he set up his own shrines in Bethel and Dan, the two, two ends of his kingdom, right. mm -hmm. specifically to keep people away from going to Jerusalem. Right. So, right. Yeah. Right. Those two places you just mentioned, Dan and then Bethel, mm -hmm. actually has an important implication for us to understand Aturus. We come to the question later, why Aturus? Yes. Why this particular site yes. was chosen for this important you know, religious cult you know, building? It is all you know, related. So this is kind of reflect that there was some sort of conflict or there was a different views where to worship in the ancient time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And Arad, even that was the case maybe in Judah kingdom as yeah, well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I think so. I'm not sure how, mm. I mean, okay, here's another way to put it too. The Bible gives us how things are supposed to be done. Archaeologist tells us how it's happening. Yeah. And it's probably somewhere between those two mm -hmm. that we find what seems to be acceptable, practice. maybe by everyone, That's right. acceptable practice. Mm -hmm. And so archaeologists has given, archaeology has given us this other angle on it, mm -hmm. which is helpful. Mm -hmm. If we really want to understand what happened, we can read the Bible. That, that may set the ideal rather than describe the actual mm -hmm. That is actually, I think, very good and right point, probably mm -hmm. archaeology shows what was going on, maybe not the real world, but part of at least the world. Yes. Mm -hmm. And then the Bible indicates where you know, people wanted to go. Yes. Mm -hmm. So the gap between these two may create you know, sometimes confusions, but it also does. it helps us to understand right. why the Bible was written in certain, you know, kind yeah. of mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, that's a very good point. And another um, set yeah. of standing stones. This is mm -hmm. a Tel Dan standing stone, right? The gate, you know. This is in the very north. Very we north. just talked about mm -hmm. uh, from, from Bethel to Dan, and Dan That's is in the right. northern part mm -hmm. of Israel. So this is not the most part of the Israelite kingdom. And then they had a very important, you know, cultic building there. Mm -hmm. And then that helps us understand why we have this building in Ataruz. And, and now we're back to Ataruz. Ataruz. So mm -hmm. we started in Ataruz. Mm -hmm. We've taken a little bit of a detour, but mm -hmm. seen some comparative materials. It is. And now we're coming back to yeah. Ataruz. So this is kind of a different angle. As you see that uh, you see standing stone in the main sanctuary room, and next to it is the offering platform. And then the room to the left is what I call the hearth room. And then the square kind of a stone structure at the floor, that is a hearth, which believes to be their holy fire was put there. So her hearth, is that another way, That's maybe right, another hearth. way to yeah. pronounce it? So okay. That's right, hearth. Excellent. And then we found a very fine ash inside that square, you know, the stone structures. No animal bones, nothing. Mm. It was a very fine ash, mm. very deep, which indicates that there was some kind of fire was inside. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But not sacrifice? Not, at least not animal sacrifice? I don't think so. That's actually one of the points that uh, we kept in our mind when we were excavating the area. So we were very meticulous, collecting all the bones, all kinds of you know, other uh, evidence. We didn't find any of those. Other part of the Aturuth, you see tons of the bones, but not in this particular room. So that is one of the reasons mm -hmm. that I think mm -hmm. is a holy right. fire. You and know, I think something you just said a minute ago about how carefully you went about mm -hmm. sifting, sorting, making sure you, you have every single trace of evidence. Mm -hmm. I think we have to say that um, the best practices in archaeology are going to give us the best answers right. to the questions we have. Yes. Mm -hmm. That is one of the major complaints from my workers, because in Ataruth we <laughs> sift Every goofas, yes. baskets, <laughs> yes, our baskets. So right. they just want to, oh, Dr. G, let's, let's just do fast. <laughs> no, because here, even the small objects right. has important implications right. for us to understand. And that gives greater credibility to what you then present. Or right. Thank you. So yeah. That's an important step. 
Okay, another uh, yeah, feature. So this is a kind of close view of that uh, hearth, okay. you know, okay. with the uh, stones. Good. Yeah. And then this is actually very close to that uh, hearth room. This is what we, I call it holy cistern. This is the cistern. Cistern is the kind of the collecting the water in the winter. And, and many of these are, are rather bell shaped. I mean, bell kind of like a like a manhole right. going down mm -hmm. and then open up. And up, up, up. Uh, from the beginning, we knew the presence of this cistern in the western courtyard. This is very close to the standing stone that we saw in a previous slide. And so, in the middle of the courtyard, close to the standing stone, close to the western high place. We knew that there is something you know, here, and then given the fire was something for the temple, why not the water? Mm -hmm. Because holy mm -hmm. could be, mm -hmm. you know, holy mm -hmm. water mm -hmm. is something mm -hmm. that uh, people use for the temple, right? Mm -hmm. So this is the investigating of the holy. Should, you know, should we system. go down, down into that the system? <laughs> That's what you were wanting to do? It is. Show us something. This is this not picture. just one of those uh, common cisterns, because no. in Atarus we have more than 30, 40 cisterns we know yeah. around the site. This one is particularly important. When we were going down and investigating the wall inside the cistern, we found this relief, which is bull. And you can see some sort of sun disk in so the middle. That's here are the horns, horns of the bull, and, the and face, then face, and then a disk here sun in the disk center. there. Mm -hmm. well, uh, the next slide, we will see there is some surprises involved in you know, this. So I'll come back to that slide okay. later. OK, excellent. A truth is kind of, a, as I said, showcase. It, when I say showcase means it contains so many things that mention in the Bible. And then this structure is something I believe to do with so-called high place. Mm -hmm. People, in other words, in Atruth, this is, you see the staircase, mm -hmm. and then this is on the eastern edge of the temple complex. This could be the place that the priests, you know, they offer something to, you know, God or sacrifice an you know, animal. So this is the high place. And high place, when you say in the Bible, high place is somewhere out in the village, far away in the remote hill. But maybe not always the case, right. at least in Atarutha's case, high place is part of. Well, may maybe in Atarutha it's both, because you really are on the top of a ridge. You yeah. have a spectacular mm -hmm. view in mm -hmm. all directions, mm -hmm. but then in the site itself is That's what right. you're calling yeah. a, a high place. Atarutha yeah. was not a common place for people's residence. It was yes. a holy Correct. city in many ways. It was uh, surrounded by this kind of a wall, and then inside, this what well, we haven't found any residential domestic areas mm -hmm. as yet. Mm -hmm. So the city itself was kind of a set aside for their religious purposes. Right, right. So that may be the reason that we made the high places Excellent. inside. Okay. Yeah. And then uh, another altar structure here? Or are you going altar to after altars? That yeah. is in Atarutha case. <laughs> we have um, almost about ten altars in Atarutha, mm. and they are inside, outside the courts. This is one of the altar in the central courtyard mm -hmm. and uh, this is a smaller one and another one I don't know why we many uh, this many you know, altars were needed uh, then maybe this is the pilgrimage place or maybe these different altars indicate the movement in other words people coming from the western side and they're starting from the first altar and move to the next one mm. we don't know but there are many altars in the courtyard and then this indicates that uh, this place is kind of pilgrimage place for the ancient people. Now you not only have installations, you have all of these artifacts, huge number of artifacts, <laughs> mm -hmm. strange artifacts, mm -hmm. um, different f in many ways from f those found. In other words, although you ha there are some parallels in yeah. other places, but, mm -hmm. but to have all of these unusual pieces in one place is, is really quite striking. It so is. So talk to us about Yeah, this. you already saw that uh, inside the system there is a bull, you know, and then this is what I named the bull storage jar. It is very common whole mouth storage jar from the second, uh, from 10th to 7th century BC. And so we have bulls here, That's all the right. way around, is that what we have? So we have heads? seven bulls around. Mm. We can, you know, recover all those. But as you see, that the rim, the top part of the storage jar is complete. And as we count that uh, the uh, the horse, there were seven, you know, bulls. And this bull storage jar was found right in the middle of the sanctuary room, right in front of the standing stone. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. this is very. And then mm, this is the other one. This is so we call bull statue. So right. bull, one bull and then another bull. Right. <laughs> this is a bull statue. Uh, this is really kind of a significant finding. And uh, this is found in the middle of the courtyard, but uh, 
I believe it was originally in the main sanctuary room. As you remember that the Atreus temple was destroyed by hostile force. As you see some of the objects here in Atreus, nothing found intact. Someone came intentionally and very hard smashed, and smashed everything. Right. And then this seems to be one of the main kind of a deity kind of a, you know, this that in the temple, and then someone probably took it from the main sanctuary and smashed it mm -hmm. in the middle of the court mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. And a, a what, suggestion of strength, of virility? Um, bulls are, but they show up elsewhere. They show up actually in one of the early uh, Israelites. That is from the Mount 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 area. Right. Because in the Bible, as you remember the Exodus you know, story, the cow or the bull mm -hmm. represent the main deity, mm -hmm. is power, fertility, mm -hmm. And then this, so bull in Ataruth, the bull worship was really kind of a common feature and probably represent the main deity that was worshipped in okay, Ataruth. Okay, let's look at some more. This is, is this? Another, uh, this is kind of a, I try to understand, but as yet, I don't know exactly what that is. But this is again from the main sanctuary, right on top of the offering platform. What is significant? I think this is at least a two-story kind of a cult stand. And the, or it could be kind of incense in a stand. Uh, uh, like one of the models, one of the, um, um, the, the model shrines that we talk about that we discussed. Yeah, I model, mean, it has some of those features. Some of those features, but model shrine is more or less kind of smaller in size than yeah. this. And then this is not kind of a stand, because we have a stand in a Taruth, but this is kind of square type. And then the more important thing that I see is that the, the two human figures mm -hmm. right in front of this mm -hmm. model. They are male figures. We have a lots of female figures, you know, associated with the shrine model. But this is, I think, probably one of the first examples showing that male figures yeah. were put. Yeah. So the question is, who those yes. two males Who's represented here? Yeah, I still don't have a clear answer, of course. I have some direction to go, but I need more evidence. But this is going to be very important objects for us to yeah, understand. Yeah. Let's look at one more. Yeah. Again, this is what you said, the shrine model that is uh, also found in the Atreus temple with the female, you know, the Correct. one. But uh, this is only one of two female kind of at the presentation. And Atarus. So, so we found them at, at, uh, at our site in America. Maybe, that's right. Where they're mm -hmm. flanking the opening and mm -hmm. marking it. Let's look at one more. Yeah. Uh, this is uh, <coughs> something, that, this is kind of a lion, kind of uh, the statue that was found with a bull statue that you saw in a previous you know, slide. Mm -hmm. So again, this was broken. And then in the ancient time, uh, oftentimes this lion stands for the Asherah. Okay, yeah. and we will have occasion to talk <laughs> about that, that sometime right. in the future too. Thank you, John. Yeah. Thank you, Larry. Mm -hmm. And thank all of you for joining us for this edition of Excavating the Bible, What Archaeology Can Teach Us. We hope we've given you something to think about and something to add to your understanding and appreciation of the Bible. Until next time, think ancient, keep believing, and keep exploring. For Excavating the Bible, I'm Doug Clark.